<laughs> anyway, Jake is one of the most amazing people in our history, I think. In fact, somebody, one scholar who wrote about him, said that he thought he was the greatest English man ever, <laughs> which I would inclined to agree with. He was not only a really good painter and a really good poet, but also a great visionary and mystic. And those three things combined are probably unique in his, his poetry. His poetry was not really appreciated during his lifetime. He was known as an artist and engraver. And his artistic works were pretty widely appreciated, I would say. But many people really thought he was completely mad because of his poetry and because of the way he lived and the things that he said. A lot of fairly recent research has been done I mean, in this century, um, which shows, sheds much more light on his influences and on the conditions in London where, where he was growing up and living here. He was a Londoner, he was born in London, he lived all his life, apart from a very brief period in the cottage uh, in Felton, which he writes about in his poetry. He definitely considered himself a Londoner. He was born in um, 1757 and died in 1827, so he was 70 years old. At that time in London, it was an extraordinary period of tremendous innovations and ferment of thought and tremendous exploration, um, spiritual and scientific explorations. And it makes me think very much of the 1960s and 70s, when the Tibetans were coming over to the West for the first time. Um, and in that time, of course, there was not only the the influx of Tibetan Buddhism in the 60s and 70s, or starting in the late 1950s. But there was enormous um, interest in all kinds of spiritual movements. And of course, um, psychedelic drugs were just beginning to be introduced. And there was a sort of huge um, arising of a of, um, kind of spirit of dissidence and um, revolt against conventions and searching for new things, especially of course among, among young people. And it seems to me very, very, must have been very, very much like that in the middle of the 18th century when Blake was born. And the particular group of um, sort of seekers that Blake was born into uh, were known as the um, dissident dissident Christians. And Christianity obviously was the main, almost exclusive religion at that time. And of course it was the Church of England in this country and other Protestant churches. But there were a group of people loosely classed together as, as the dissidents who were much more radical than that. And they gave rise to movements led, for instance, by John Wesley and other people like that. They were also greatly influenced by a movement that came from the continent known as the Moravian Church, which is extremely interesting. And they had links with Oriental um, th things that were being newly discovered, um, from, even from the Far East, certainly from India, from the Middle East. They also had huge links with Jews all over Europe who were practicing Kabbalah. And, um, which is a very secret, mystical aspect of Judaism. And then there just seems to have been a kind of underground of, of completely international scholars and philosophers and other seekers and scientists as well, moving backwards and forwards, but particularly uh, between Germany, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, and this country. And they were like a kind of secret group of, of uh, really interesting people. And among them was Swedenborg, who had a big influence in this country. And Blake's mother, in particular, was a great devotee of these groups. 
and in fact his whole family and his mother's family <coughs> were devotees of the Moravian Church, which was quite close in Fetter Lane, in the city, which is quite close to where Nick was born and grew up. And through this, he really had access to many ideas, not exactly Buddhist ideas, but to many ideas that, that are similar to Buddhism, and particularly which occur in Vajrayana. It's very hard to say, it would be a fascinating subject, and I'm sure there are people working on it, how much direct influence there was maybe along the Silk Road between all these different movements. I've always been more inclined to believe that all these um, spiritual groups are searching the basic nature of, of human beings, and so they will come up with similar conclusions in any case. And of course, these insights are expressed in terms of the culture and the religion of different people. So while they might seem quite different on the surface, they're pointing to the same experience and the same reality. So one can't at all say that William Blake could possibly have been a Buddhist. He would have heard the Buddha's name, but actually very, very little at that time was known about Buddhism itself. And so far as it was known, it was regarded as a sect of Hinduism, which in my opinion it is actually, but um, it was hardly uh, really researched at all at that stage as being anything separate. Mm -hmm. But more and more was coming out of the Hindu scriptures, including the Tantras, and very similar ideas existed already in the West, in alchemy and in the um, Judaic tradition. Um, and uh, the, Mora the people in the Moravian church and then in the movement started by Sweetwater, <coughs> who was a philosopher and scientist and um, mystic, um, really have remarkably similar writings. Uh, there's, uh, um, Swedenborg House in Bloomsbury, um, which uh, has members who are still practicing his teachings, I suppose. And they have a huge library and a bookshop of his works. And I've had a brief look, I haven't really looked in detail at Swedenborg's writings. But they read like, like tantric books, really like um, Mahayana treatises sometimes. And indeed some of Blake's own um, visionary poems, which he called prophetic books, have a very similar feeling to them. So there are all these affinities rather than direct influences. So I would say there are four separate areas in which Blake has always seemed to me extraordinarily close to Buddhism. So one is that area, which you could call the tantric influence. Another thing is his, his extraordinary sense of compassion. I have not come across any other poet who has written so much and so movingly about the sufferings of human beings and of all living beings, which he obviously deeply felt in his life. The other very Buddhist approach which again he must have kind of imbibed from um, all these people that he was mingling with in his youth, is the sense of the illusory nature of the world. And then alongside that, the world is illusory, but it is also expressing the truth. And it's we who don't see correctly. So this is this is really what Trumbo Rinpoche called sacred vision or sacred outlook. And Trumbo Rinpoche said, everything, the, the, the whole universe is sending us messages all the time, but we don't hear it. And that everything is a symbol of itself. It's self-secret. We see, most of the time, we only see the surface appearance. But the inner nature of everything is speaking to us all the time, revealing itself. And many great poets 
and philosophers have expressed similar thoughts. I think probably last time I was here I was quoting some maybe poets and other writers who certainly could not by any means be called Buddhist, but who through their insight, which is really just human insight, have expressed the same thoughts. So most of this talk will be actually reading quotations from Greg. So I'm afraid I will be reading out a lot of it, which I don't particularly like to do, but it seems the only way of getting everything in. So one of the most important um, things that he repeats many times throughout his poetry is everything that lives is holy. And um, I should say also that you know, as a human being he was a very remarkable person. Obviously he must have been extremely difficult to get on with in many ways. And he was very, very stubborn and um, of course he had to have patrons supporting him. He bitterly resented this and treated many of his patrons very badly. But apart from those sort of normal human problems that he had, mm -hmm. it's clear that he tried very, very hard to, to live a really uh, a life that was completely in accordance with his beliefs. And all his friends said that he was remarkably generous, not that he had any, he could not be financially generous, he wasn't in a position to, but that he was extremely friendly to everyone, good to everyone, um, compassionate to animals, which was not so common in those days. And his whole outlook on life was one of a really good man. He would have called himself a Christian, absolutely, but his idea of Christianity was very, very unorthodox. And most of his writings, the prophetic books, uh, are are expressed in terms of Christianity. He refers to Jesus a lot. His idea of God is most unusual. Um, he believed very much in something that really just corresponds to Buddha nature or to the basic nature of reality. As soon, his idea was that as soon as God becomes um, a projection, really, as a father or as a judge, and particularly the, the notions of God you find in the Old Testament, then that is a perversion of, of reality. And he had a wonderful name for God, which is Nobo Daddy. <laughs> so that was what he thought of, <laughs> of God. Um, Philip Pullman, by the way, who was a huge admirer of Blake, I think that's, that's exactly his idea of God as well. And I have read Philip Pullman's books. Um, Blake sees no distinction at all between God and humanity. Um, one of his poems is uh, called The Everlasting Gospel, where he's telling the story of Christ. Um, so I'll read more of it in this quotation that I've got here. It's very interesting in his approach to religion in general. Um, So he says that the, the, the divinity, which is which we call God in a rather unsatisfactory way, this divinity is the actual nature of human beings and, in fact, of all life, and it manifested itself completely in order to reveal this to the world in the person of Jesus Christ. He says that Christ is the divine nature in every person. And um, he tells in this poem how uh, Jesus is praying to his father, God the Father, because he is not yet fully mature. He hasn't realized his own nature. And he sort of humbles himself before God the Father and asks his advice. And God the Father reproves him, saying, If thou humblest thyself, thou humblest me. Thou also dwellest in eternity. Thou art a man, God is no more. Thine own humanity learn to adore. 
So it's saying completely that divine nature is manifested through human nature. And he said, everything on earth is the word of God, and his essence is God. He saw the Bible, and particularly the Old Testament, as a kind of um, psychodrama, a uh, mythology, showing the development of, of human nature, in fact. And in his very long prophetic books, he, some names he invents. He also uses a lot of biblical names as allegorical characters to describe psychological processes, really. And these books are really difficult to read. But they are beautiful poetry at the same time. Um, and they do have extraordinary insights in them, but you have to, sort of, you have to work quite hard to read them. But that's the same with the sutras and tantras, of course, as well. So he says the material world is like a dream or a shadow. It's the world of eternal death. Our true humanity, our divine nature, is um, really on a journey, like a sort of continual bardo. Our true nature, which we don't realize, moves through states of sleep. And he says these are states that are not, but are, they seem to be. But we entirely believe in them, because we are caught in this dream world. And in this dream world, which is unique to each one of us, although they overlap and interact with each other, each person carries around their own space and time. So space and time are entirely um, subjective and do not have any ultimate reality, and nor does materiality itself. And he talked about the sea of time and space, and one of, one of the drawings in the exhibition, the sea of time and space. Um, he believed that the divine humanity is a uh, total integrated combination of the male and female principles, and that all the problems in the world came from an original split between these two, which eventually manifests in the two sexes, male, that we have to be either male or female or something in between, but we are not born as integrated wholes, which is our true state. And also that God and the external world, in other words, the principle of, of um, ultimate truth or reality and the manifest <coughs> appearance are not essentially different in any way. And that part of this split was splitting into the idea of material and non-material, inner and outer, all the dualities that we um, that are expressed in, in Buddhism as well. And this reminded me of um, Trimba Rinpoche's line from a translation that he made, clear the confusion caused for a time by the sundering of God and mind and the universe. So it's this splitting up of, of these fundamental things that causes our problems. He, he writes quite a lot about the, um, the fact that time and space do not really exist. One of his pro uh, proverbs from the marriage of heaven and hell says, the hours of folly are measured by the clock, but of wisdom no clock can measure. So time only applies to the samsaric realm of folly. Each man carries around his own space, he says. And now, in fact, I think there's, there's quite a similarity in the prophetic books of the sutras like the Avatansaka, where you get this wonderful vision of everything interconnecting, everything reflecting everything else. And the immense richness that's contained in every single thing, and, how, and the idea of how every atom contains the whole universe. That's very, very much present in Blake's writing. And then there's his famous verse, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour.
and he says that the that sin does not exist. Sin is a is a false perception. Sin and virtue, and the the original problem that we have is error. So he actually uses the same word, and error is the best translation, really, um, of the basic problem in Buddhism as Buddhism sees it. So it's erring, it's wandering, wandering away from the truth. And he actually says the only way to, to overcome error is through the annihilation of selfhood, which sounds a totally Buddhist concept. Of course, what he meant by selfhood is a um, very subtle concept, as it is in Buddhism. And I'm sure it was as much understood in his writings as it is still today in Buddhism. So um, it was certainly not anything like uh, putting oneself down, which it so often becomes in, in not only Buddhist teachings, but in all religions. So he himself was immensely self-assured and confident and he could even be quite arrogant. And one can say the same of all the great Buddhist teachers that we know about. And one of his great things was, he, he said, if the sun and moon should doubt, they'd immediately go out. <laughs> Everything exists through its self-belief, in fact. Um, <coughs> so this sense of confidence and Vajra pride in the Tantras, this is all part of um, what the self should really mean. So the annihilation of selfhood is the annihilation of everything, all the false kind of perceptions that we, uh, we um, attach to this idea of self, <coughs> like um, grasping possessiveness and the feeling of being separate from others. So again, Blake constantly expresses in his paintings even, one can say, I think, and certainly expresses in his poetry, is the interdependence of all human beings and of all forms of life in the whole universe. And so he thinks, where, as religions developed, um, they developed priesthoods and organizations which arose because of this principle of feeling separate, feeling superior to others, and so on. <coughs> and this arises jealousy and secretiveness and deceit. And he thinks this is particularly, comes particularly strong in any organizations like the church or the state. And he was equally against the abuse of power in the church and the state. So he was an absolute revolutionary and a dissident in so many areas. In fact, he got into trouble and was arrested at one point for expressing anti-monarchist views. But he didn't really take uh, much part in political life at all, but it would have been extremely dangerous in those days to do so in any case. He, he caused enough trouble for himself just by his <laughs> um, poetry. So he said, state and commerce prevent the expression of love and the oppressive laws of the church prevent the expression of love. And you said that Jesus Christ is pure love and absolutely the expression of the real meaning of love. So this is very much a Bodhisattva view of life. Um, his, his wonderful uh, short um, book of uh, verses and, and proverbs is called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And that has some of his most wonderful sayings in it. One of them is, prisons are built with stones of law, brothels with bricks of religion. And these are all justified in the name of the tyrannical God, who is really not God at all, but Satan, who he calls the accuser of sin. So it's the idea of judgment and accusing, and judging others and judging ourselves, and thinking this is good and this is bad. But he's so, so against religion. And he says that Jesus broke all the Ten Commandments, <laughs> um, mutual forgiveness of each vice, such are the gates of paradise. He says. Mm. 
so much of his um, attitude to life is expressed in his simplest poems, which are the songs of innocence and experience. And innocence and experience is also seems like a very Buddhist idea. Innocence is somehow like primordial purity. Um, it is the essence of, of everything, and it's kind of fundamental. It's, it's almost the idea of, um, what's the Zen saying? Um, Zen mind, beginner's mind. It's a safe state of complete openness. But it also can turn into naivety, and it can very, be very easily manipulated and abused, of course. And the Songs of Innocence were written for children, and from the point of view of children, and from the point of view of the child in all of us. And they give a kind of heavenly picture of things. Um, which is very naive, because obviously terrible things are happening. But also at the same time, there's an expectation that everything will be right in the end. And in these poems, there's a little boy lost and an angel finds him and leads him back home. And there's a little girl lost, and the wild animals rescue her and take care of her until her parents find her, that kind of thing. Um, so maybe I'll read one or two of them. <coughs> so it's a kind of um, the kind of approach which should never be lost in life, and which creates a wonderful sense of childlike wonder and appreciation of the world, but which is also also needs to be balanced by experience, which is his other sort of themes. Um, and I think about several of Trimber of Chase poems seem to express this idea. I didn't bring it, unfortunately, but he's a lovely poem about the child sitting at Does anyone well, do you happen to know it by heart? <laughs> the child who is um, born with no name and uh, he's looking around himself in, in wonder and he, he sees the stars shining and he sees the, the sand in front of him. He puts a handful of sand in his mouth and just enjoys the taste of it. And everything is like jewel like and new and fresh. And uh, from the she was very taken with this kind of image of life and how we should not lose that ever. So one or two of the poems from pity, peace, and love, all pray in their distress, and to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. For mercy, pity, peace, and love is God our Father dear, and mercy, mercy, pity, peace, and love is man his child and care. For mercy has a human heart, pity a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. So this is the very kindly idea of God that children have. And in these poems, God is not wrathful or judgmental at all, but always rescues the someone who is lost. Then cherish pity lest you drive an angel from your door. And there's a lovely poem about um, an emmet, which is a, an old word for ant. And this again shows his, his sort of feeling of concern for all creatures. Once a dream did weave a shade 
o'er my angel guarded bed. As an emmet lost its way, where on grass methought I lay. Troubled, wildered, and forlorn, dark, benighted, travel worn, over many a tangled spray, all heartbroke I heard her say, Oh, my children, do they cry? Do they hear their father sigh? Now they look abroad to see, now return and weep for me. Pitying, I dropped a tear, but I saw a glowworm near, who replied, What wailing wight calls the watchman of the night? I am set to light the ground while the beetle goes his round. Follow now the beetle's hum, little wanderer, hie thee home. <laughs> There's a lovely poem called On Another's Sorrow. Can I see another's woe and not be in sorrow too? Can I see another's grief and not seek for kind relief? Can I see a falling tear and not feel my sorrow's share? Can a father see his child weep nor be with sorrow filled? Can a mother sit and hear an infant groan, an infant fear? No, no, never can it be. Never, never can it be. And can he who smiles on all hear the wren with sorrows small, hear the small birds' grief and care, hear the woes that infants bear, and not sit beside the nest, pouring pity in their breast, and not sit the cradle near, weeping tear on infants' tear, and not sit both night and day, wiping all our tears away, Oh no, never can it be. Never, never can it be. So that's his child's view of God. And, um, and then the songs of experience. Um, some of them are direct counterparts to things in the songs of innocence. And where's one about the genius? Yes, there's a rather long poem about Chimney Sweep, which is very sad because young children were apprenticed as chimney sweeps and had a terrible life going up the chimneys. Um, and they had to go up naked, so even in the freezing winter, they were, they were getting scratched and covered in soot. But in this poem, he describes his horrible life but at the same time, he says he's happy, and then he goes out in the sun and runs around and, is, and washes in the river, and is happy. And, uh, and he thinks because he's happy, then you know God loves him and everything smiles on him. But then there's another one about the chimney sweeping, songs of experience, where he is really. Uh, much more aware of, of how terrible his condition is and the hypocrisy of, of, of the adults and particularly his parents. A little black thing among the snow, that's him, crying weep, weep in notes of woe. Where are thy father and mother? Say, they are both gone up to the church to pray. <laughs> And because I am happy and dance and sing, they think me they have done me no injury, and are gone to praise God and his priest and king, who make up a heaven of our misery. So experience teaches you the meaning of suffering, but it's also absolutely necessary for wisdom to arise. There are such wonderful poems in here, but perhaps not so relevant to this theme of Buddhism. Um, <coughs> the Clod and the Pebble. This is perhaps his absolutely most Buddhist poem. Really lovely. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care, but for another gives its ease, and builds a heaven in hell's despair. So sang a little clod of clay, trodden with the cattle's feet, but a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet, 
Love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight. Joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. So, again, one of his favorite themes that we make our own hell and heaven. And, uh, and, that's, and that's so like a lot of the scriptures. Yes, from the Lord Chari Avatara, whatever suffering there is in the world is all through wanting pleasure for oneself. Whatever joy there is in the world is all through wishing happiness for others. And again from the Dhammapada, everything we experience is led by mind, is subject to mind, is made by mind. If one acts with an impure mind, Suffering follows, as the wheels of a cart follow the ox's footprints. Everything we experience <coughs> is led by mind, is subject to mind, is made by mind. If one acts with a pure mind, joy follows like a shadow that never departs. They could absolutely have loved that. Um, one of his uh, proverbs from the Marriage of Heaven and Hell, the most sublime act is <coughs> before you. That will come straight out of you. And everything that lives, lives not alone, nor for itself. And then there is a poem corresponding to the divine image, which is the one I read about mercy, pity, peace and love, how they have the human form. The opposite that can happen if one um, acts with self-love instead of love for, for another. Um, cruelty has a human heart and jealousy a human face. <coughs> Terror the human form divine and secrecy the human dress. The human dress is forged iron, the human form a fiery forge, the human face a furnace sealed, the human heart its hungry gorge. In fact, he thought this poem was a bit too, too strong. He didn't include it in um, his early copies of the Sons of Experience. One other one I really want to read is There are two others. The Garden of Love. I went to the Garden of Love and saw what I never had seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green. And the gates of this chapel were shut. And thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the Garden of Love that so many sweet flowers bore, and I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be. And priests in black gowns were walking their arms and binding with briars my joys and desires. And then one of his really most um, strongest poems, I think, of expressing his compassion, called London. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow, and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every ban, the mind-forged manacles I hear. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls. And the hapless soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets, I hear how the youthful harlots curse 
blasts the newborn infant's tear and blights with plagues the marriage house. <laughs> so that sort of shows his general attitude to life. Another thing is that pity has become a trade and generosity a science that men get rich by. That seems fairly still to be the case. As in, and about the meaning of experience. This is from um, from one of the prophetic books, I can't remember which. What is the price of experience? Do men buy it for a song? Or wisdom for a dance in the street? No. It is bought with the price of all that a man hath, his house, his wife, his children. Wisdom is sold in the desolate market where none come to buy, and in the withered field where the farmer plows for bread in vain. It is an easy thing to triumph in the summer sun and in the vintage, and to sing on the wagon loaded with corn. It is an easy thing to talk of patience to the afflicted, to speak the laws of prudence to the homeless wanderer, to listen to the hungry ravens cry in wintry season, when the red blood is filled with wine and with the marrow of lambs. It is an easy thing to laugh at wrathful elements, to hear the dog howl at the wintry door, the ox in the slaughterhouse moan, to see a god on every wind and a blessing on every blast, to hear sounds of love in the thunderstorm that destroys our enemy's home, to rejoice in the blight that covers his field and the sickness that cuts off his children, when our olive and our vine sing and laugh around our door, and our children bring fruit and flowers. Then the groan and the dollar are quite forgotten, and the slave grinding at the mill, and the captive in chains, and the poor in the prison, and the soldier in the field, when the shattered bone has laid him groaning among the happy dead. It is an easy thing to rejoice in a tense of prosperity. Thus could I sing and thus rejoice, but it is not so with me. Some of his poems about nature and animals are very lovely. Um, <coughs> there's quite a long poem called The Auguries of Innocence, which relates to this feeling of um, <coughs> a kind of instinctive, natural connection with nature and how nature speaks to us. And rather, as from Brimter used to say, that he could see um, omens and um, predictions and advice for what he should do in nature. He didn't really need to, to do conventional methods of divination if he wanted to find something out. He said you could just look around you and, and the answer would come. And indeed one can certainly feel that, I think, and certainly see. I don't know anything that can happen. And I'm sure so many of, of our kind of folk traditions like um, like about magpies, one magpie is unlucky, two magpies are lucky, things like that, come from kind of experiences that people had of that sort. And you would suddenly see something in nature that you knew was a warning, and you can't say why. It's like listening to music, you know it's saying something to you, but you can't put into words the exact process of what it's saying. And somehow these things became formulated over time. <coughs> so here is a a few short extracts from the Orgues of Innocence. A robin redbreast in a cage puts all heaven in a rage. A dog starved at his master's gate predicts the ruin of the state. A horse misused upon the road calls to heaven for human blood. Each outcry of the hunted hair of fibre from the brain does tear. And then he says, um, on the other hand, there's some 
if animals are left alone and left to follow their natural way of life, that this, this will also improve the life of human beings and have effect you know, throughout the whole world. So he's talking about the wild animals, first of all. Every wolf's and lion's howl raises from hell a human soul. The wild deer wandering here and there keeps the human soul from care. The beggar's dog, the widow's cat, feed them and thou wilt grow fat. And there's a lovely poem I'd like to read from the Songs of Experience which shows his really tender feeling for everything called The Fly. which is sort of uh, reminds me of Shakespeare saying as flies to as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods. So he, Shakespeare's just comparing you know, the uncertainty of our life with the life of the flies that are so easily um, squashed out by human beings. But Blake actually goes very much further and identifies himself with the fly in a very beautiful way. Little fly, thy summer's play, my thoughtless hand has brushed away. Am not I a fly like thee? Or art, thou, art not thou a man like me? For I dance and drink and sing till some blind hand shall brush my wing. If thought is life and strength and breath and the want of thought is death, then am I a happy fly if I live or if I die. So, moving on more to his, um, his the view, his philosophy of life, um, I think these poems have shown already quite a lot his sense of the um, illusory nature of life. But then he writes many very beautiful things about how um, the world of the senses, the world of experience, um, is deceptive, but how we can cut through this and see the true nature of things. So he says, the fool sees not the same tree that a wise man sees. And he wrote in a letter to one of his patrons, the tree which moves some to tears of joy is to the eyes of others only a green thing which stands in the way. <laughs> and he himself really from a very early age had visions um, of the essential nature of living things. And he would see this expressed as angels, or as fairies, or as kind of fantastical, half-human and half-animal creatures. And he did, he did drawings of many of these things. There's a wonderful drawing, which is in the exhibition, The Ghost of a Flea, mm -hmm. really amazing. And then his, his other wonderful paintings, he, he paints uh, the spirit of Nelson, the spirit of Pitt, various other um, famous people. And these, these are always sort of ideal images of, of young men, usually naked, um, with the sun's rays all around them, kind of um, archetypal images. And this apparently is how he really would see people a lot of the time. And he, he said that he always saw with a double vision by which he meant things as they ordinarily appear to us, but at the same time their essential nature, which quite often appear to be in these fantastical forms. And he very often speaks of being inspired by angels and fairies who dictate his poems, and, and particularly the longer prophetic books to him. So there's a lovely one where um, he sees a fairy and he asks the fairy, what is the material world? Is it dead? And the fairy says to him, I'll sing to you to this soft lute and show you all alive the world where every particle of dust breathes forth its joy. I 
and he called this faculty that we have of seeing this the imagination. So the imagination to him is the very highest um, attribute of human beings, really. And another thing he said, Christ is the imagination. Um, and he uses this word imagination throughout his work. <coughs> his vision or imagination is a representation of what eternally exists, really and unchangeably. This world of imagination is the world of eternity. And the visions of eternity, by reason of narrow perception, are become weak visions of time and space, fixed into furrows of death. Man's perceptions are not bounded by organs of perception. He perceives more than the senses, though ever so acute can discover. So we do have the capacity to see beyond our organs of perception. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow tricks of his cover. This life's dim windows of the soul distorts the heavens from pole to pole and leads you to believe a lie when you see with, not through the eye. And it seems that he was sort of in this visionary state for a large part of the time, um, which is part of the reason why people thought he was mad. And they seriously did. And they, admit, they admitted that he was a great artist. They couldn't understand his, his poetry at all. And they did think he was absolutely mad. Even many of his friends, I think, and his supporters did, did think so. And um, another time he, he really asserted that he didn't notice the the apparent reality of the ordinary world at all. It is as the dirt upon my feet, no part of me. What, it will be questioned, when the sun rises, do you not see a round disk of fire, somewhat like a guinea? Oh, no, no. I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So he was really constantly in what we would think of as a state of samadhi. And his wife Catherine once um, said to a friend, I have very little of Mr. Blake's company. He is always in paradise. <laughs> Another lovely bit from the marriage of heaven and hell. Really the marriage of heaven and hell is, is the most essential for his writing, but I think it just gives the essence of his thought. Um, does a firm persuasion that a thing is so make it so? All poets believe that it does. And in ages of imagination, this firm persuasion removed mountains. But many are not capable of firm persuasion of anything. So that's to, right, to do with his idea of um, confidence and not doubting. <coughs> His other great idea is the concept of energy. So part of this original split that happened um, in human nature and in the nature of the universe itself um, is a split into what he called reason on the one hand and energy on the other side, on the other hand. And both of these, of course, like wisdom and compassion in Buddhism, are inextricable and need each other. But they have become, because they have become split, they have become unbalanced. And, um, he thinks that religion um, uh, used this, this duality. But he says, without contraries, there is no, no progression. Attraction and repulsion, reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. From these contraries spring what the religious call good and evil. Good is the passive that obeys reason. Evil is the active springing from energy. Good is heaven, evil is hell. So this is what the churches teach, but this is not what we do. <coughs> he says the churches are afraid of evil, and authorities, secular authorities also, of course, are afraid of evil, and so they're afraid of energy, and so they, they call it evil. 
and they identify evil with energy. But he says, energy is the only life and is from the body. And reason is the bound or outward circumference of energy. Energy is eternal delight. <coughs> Trungpa Rinpoche said that the perception of reality as energies is Tantra. So many definitions of Tantra that he gave. So he's really together with Blake in that. Um, and again, Blake had this very tantric perception that um, all the passions, all the energies that we are capable of are not evil in themselves, but, but are only uh, used for evil through grasping and through selfishness. So, quotation from the Hevatra Tantra, those things by which beings are bound through evil action, by skillful means they are released by those very things from the bondage of existence. By passion the world is bound, and by passion too it is released. Um, Blake said some of his proverbs occur from the marriage of and death. He who desires but acts not breeds pestilence. Sooner murder an infant in its cradle than nurse unacted desires. And um, I remember from Richard saying that and it's considered much easier to overcome hatred because that's just like a one-headed creature. You can cut off its head. But to overcome desire, desire is like a hydra. Every time you cut off one head, another one will arrive. So that, that's exactly he who desires, but that's not breeds pestilence. And then he says, the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom. So that really means exactly as, as Padreyama teaches. It doesn't mean necessarily <coughs> indulging oneself in excess, but in acknowledging that energy and acknowledging the kind of utmost um, power and the utmost possible manifestation of energy in every form, which can be turned entirely to good and for the benefit of others. So in the marriage of heaven and hell, he, uh, he talks about this duality a lot. And um, he, of course, in his usual way, talks with angels and with devils and with all kinds of spiritual beings. But he particularly enjoys talking to the devils in hell because he thinks they're much wiser than the angels. Yes, he has two versions of them when he talks about angels. Some are genuine angels who are truly wise. <coughs> and he says they're, they're wise because they are so humble. And they don't think they are great and, and wise. But too many of the angels are sort of puffed up with pride. <laughs> they're, they're what most people... I've always found the angels have the vanity to speak of themselves as the only wise. This they do with a confident, confident insolence, sprouting from systematic reasoning. And then he talks in, and he goes, he, he gets fed up with talking to the angels. And he says, walking among the fires of hell, delighted with the enjoyments of genius, which to angels looks like torment and insanity. <laughs> So it's, the, it's the, the devils in hell who actually give him this teaching about cleansing the doors of perception. And they tell him, when perception is purified, the whole creation will be consumed and appear infinite and holy, whereas it now appears finite and corrupt. This will come to pass by an improvement of sensual enjoyment. And then he ends this, this passage with a wonderful... Um, bit. When I came home on the abyss of the five senses, where a flat-sided steep frowns over the present world, I saw a mighty devil folded in black clouds, hovering on the side of the rock. With corroding fires, he wrote the following sentence, now perceived by the minds of men and read by them on earth. 
How do you know but every bird that cuts the airy way is an immense world of delight closed by your senses five? Delight was another of his favorite words, which is sort of like a massacre. It's just the soul of sweet delight can never be defiled. from another of the prophetic books. Error is created, truth is eternal. Error or creation, we would say samsara, will be burned up, and then and not till then, truth or eternity will appear. It is burnt up the moment men cease to behold it. His sense of, of what error is, of course, is closely united to the, uh, closely um, connected with this idea of selfhood, um, which, just as in Buddhism, is really a sense of grasping. That's what um, the self needs to be uh, annihilated in his words, is, and uh, that's expressed in his lovely verse He who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. One thought fills immensity. That's a very biggest thought. In your bosom you bear your heaven and earth and all you behold. Though it appears without, it is within in your imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. Imagination is the divine humanity, and Jesus is the imagination. And he put these perceptions of his really into action the whole of his life. He, he did live in that way, definitely, very much. And one of his lovely things that he said is, prayer is the study of art, praise is the practice of art. And in this sense, I think what he means by art is the use of the imagination. In his case, it was his painting and his poetry. And, um, he felt that this, this is much more true spirituality and, stri and true religion than actually going to church or obeying the laws or, or doctrines. Um, I think it's interesting to sort of look at the, these two things. Prayer is a study of art. So the study of art is sort of preparing to create a work of art or um, contemplation, in a way, that kind of meditation of, of, of looking closely, and the passion on meditation, perhaps, or in terms of ordinary life, of um, being mindful, because he certainly saw all our actions as works of art. And he, 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 whatever he said, he meant it to apply to every single person. And of course, he knew that not every single person um, practiced one of the arts. So this sense of prayer is a sense of, of being always um, being always open to the inspiration of art or of life itself, um, being wakeful, being mindful, being present. Praise is the practice of art. That's the actual expression. So there's this wonderful Zen story, which I never get quite right. I mean, it's about two Zen masters, and one met the other on the road, and one 
when the city meditates and the other master came along. And in the Zen manner, they were kind of testing each other and kind of playing with each other's uh, realization. So the one who had come along said to the first one, um, are you meditating in order to attain enlightenment? And the one who was already meditating said, no, I'm med- no. Are you meditating to attain Buddha nature? And the other one answered, no, I'm meditating to express Buddha nature. <laughs> and this is what we all do in meditation. In right from the very beginning, I'm sure in, um, in, in Dzogchen teachings, this is actually um, expressed from the very beginning. But in, certainly in some Buddhist traditions, this is not emphasized. Um, I feel it could be very helpful if it was. But we can't, we, we can't attain Buddha nature. We can't search for Buddha nature. We have to somehow um, open ourselves to it, which is prayer is the study of art, and then express it, which is praise, is the, nature, is the practice of art. So prayer and praise is a wonderful concept, I think. Um, it sort of links in with a lot of other great poems, uh, Rupa and others, which I may have quoted last time. There's a wonderful poem, Rilke, um, where the, the, the first line is, Poet, what do you do? I praise. And then the poem goes through. How can you praise when there's such evil in the world? How can you praise when um, such terrible things happen and so on? And he just, the poet he just keeps re- repeating, yes, I praise. And then the, 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 the question says, how, how can you be so sure that you're right? You know, what right have you to say this to us? Because I praise. And then how is it that the stars and the storm recognize you as uh, kind of a kindred spirit because I praise. That's just so wonderful. <laughs> and there's a, a lovely um, sort of in relation to that rejoicing, um, which is sort of both prayer and praise is rejoicing. And of course, in, in the Buddhist sutras, they soften end with um, all the all the um, listeners to the teaching. They they rejoice and praise the words of the blessed one. There's always a sense of rejoicing and praising. And that's what I was going to say was this lovely little story about the composer Shostakovich, who was living in absolute terror, in terror of, of Stalin uh, sending him off to come. And, uh, it was, uh, this incident actually happened right at the end of the war. Of course, uh, Shostakovich was living in St. Petersburg, which was besieged and was starved. And, undergoing a terrible time. And then they just heard the news of the bomb being dropped on Hiroshima, which of course in some ways brought an end to the war, but also was such a terrible thing. And um, Shostakovich and his circle of friends were absolutely appalled by this. And he was walking with another friend who was sort of moaning about the whole situation, sort of saying, you know, how, how can we write music? How can we be creative at all when these terrible things happen? And Toskovich turned to him and said, our job is to rejoice. Mm-hmm. Wonderful poem by, um, <coughs> by uh, Auden. Um, follow poet, follow right to the bottom of the night. With your unconstraining voice, teach the free man to rejoice. So I think that's... I haven't really mentioned, yes, the other implications of the um, teachings of the Moravian Church, which which Blake was sort of more or less born into and brought up with, and the teachings of the philosopher Swedenborg. Um, which was so very touching. And the, these included a huge emphasis on sexual enjoyment and sexuality, which of course is just pure Vajrayana. And they would have love feasts, um, which certainly were full of great enjoyment, which is sort of like Dunshackers. Mm-hmm. And they, 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 
there were different opinions among them whether it should be um, purely marital sex or whether both men and women were kind of free really to have many partners. And there were big differences of opinion among them on that. Blake himself uh, was very inclined to, th to wish that, that there could be absolutely free love. And he actually said, if he came home and found his wife, Catherine, had been unfaithful, would I mind? No, not at all. <laughs> so I have my doubts about whether that would have worked out. But anyway, Catherine actually was extremely faithful to him. And he suggested at one time um, bringing a young woman into, the, into his household. And uh, Mrs. Blake was so upset about this that he gave up the idea. But he did theoretically think it was a very good idea. And he did express this a lot in his poems, in fact, and in a, in a lot of the um, prophetic books, if you could be bothered to read them, you will find these sort of things rather mysteriously expressed. I mean, he doesn't write about it openly, but it's certainly there. And I think. Um, Yes, of course, we can never really know how much Blake actually practiced meditation. Um, but I think he definitely did in some way. And it seems from, from what's come out recently, there's a wonderful book, if, you're interested, if anyone's interested in following this up, called Why Mrs. Blake Cried, which was published in, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, not all that long ago, which... Um, uh, the author had found out a lot, had, had done a lot of research in, in the um, records of the Moravian Church, in fact, and had found a lot of documents which had hitherto not been known about, um, showing their influences, which come from, probably from, quite a lot from Hindu Tantra. The only absolute direct connection with Buddhism at all that, can, that I found in Blake's work is, is a little uh, um, in his paintings. One of the paintings which is in the exhibition, which you may know anyway, is the spirit of William Pitt. Mm -hmm. He did two, the spirit of Nelson and the spirit of Pitt, which is kind of visionary figures arising, you know, guiding the nation. And around, the, uh, around many of his, of his paintings, um, there are kind of halos around them person's head, which may or may not come from Oriental influences. I mean, they were very Christian iconography anyway. But this particular halo around the head of Pitt is almost like a sculpture. And it's like a stone um, with, you know, carvings around little flowery motifs in the stone. And it has a flame coming out at the top. It looks absolutely Buddhist. And I think he must have got this from a book of engravings that was published in London, which was made from archaeological drawings. Um, archaeologists in India at that time were just beginning to discover ancient Buddhist statues and monuments. Very few of them at that stage. And they didn't really distinguish what was Buddhist and what was Hindu. So I think that's the only thing. But that is definitely a very Buddhist feeling to that um, thing. And many people have said that, that there are a lot of figures in his drawings and paintings that could be thought of as non Um They might be, I and mean, he may have <coughs> seen pictures of non Or it may just simply be you know, a universal um, artistic expression, which I think people have used all over the world. And after all, Jung found that the mandala is an archetypal symbol which arises in all cultures. So uh, why did I start saying that? Oh yes, <laughs> possible influences from the East. I don't think there would have been anything directly Buddhist at that stage, but there certainly were influences which came through um, the people who were following these um, uh, views of the Moravian Church in particular, um, which came from Hindu Tantra and from Taoism, which had, has very similar ideas, particularly about um, sort of sacramental ritual sexuality and the importance of using all the senses and of not being afraid of any, not being afraid of the body in fact. 
and the body is sacred, and the body and mind are absolutely inseparable. So this came from, and also that came from um, Persian, ancient Persian ideas, it's certainly present. And I think these Moravians had sources really from all over the world, and they were interested in any texts they could get hold of. And whether there were actually any, any living teachers who they were in contact with is more doubtful. But they were very sincere people. They weren't just sort of, um, uh, what's the word, um, kind of pleasure seekers, want you? sensation seekers. I think they were absolutely genuinely interested in all these teachings as spiritual practices and transforming practices. And a lot of things also from Kabbalah, that was another very important influence in mystical Jewish tradition. And also from alchemy. So all of these streams came together in this extraordinarily fascinating world that Blake was moving in, in London in the middle of the 18th century. And so I, I think he and Catherine together did actually practice a kind of meditation. Um, and she was very open to all of that. But she didn't want to go beyond, she didn't want him to have concubines. <laughs> so he had to imagine them instead. But he, also, he also was very, um, he does express, I think in many times, and Sweden, Swedenborg's writings also express mm -hmm. that it does not have to be literally a physical woman. You can. We achieve the same results with an imagined consort, mm -hmm. which of course is also a very tantric idea. So I think that's about it. If anyone has any questions. Do you know if uh, Trump or Michel ever read any of his poems? Because you know, one of the students, Al Ginsberg, was obsessed with them. I'm sure, he'd, I'm, sh I'm sure that Al Ginsberg would have used it, but I never heard him actually talk about it. Or when I first knew him, we discussed poetry a lot. But I don't think Blake came into it. Maybe, I was become remember it. But it is quite difficult, really, to, to get into Blake, I think. And I'm sure Richard would have found most interesting the, the prophetic books, which are quite hard to read. I'm sure he was on the same wavelength there. Yeah, I think it's a huge fan. So I'm thinking of two quotations. I must create my own system or yes. be enslaved by another's. Yes. And then he said about the church with a capital C, the vision of Christ that thou dost see is my vision's greatest enemy. Yes. So he was always, for me personally, a, a beacon of somebody who, uh, in, in a time, because he was going against the master current of his time, which was bec what becoming scientism, where the yes. world was a material... Newton was his, his metaphorical yes, enemy, right, yeah. perceiving the universe as a giant mechanism, a clock, which Blake was set himself against. Yes. So he was going again, but the world was going with Newton. We've moved into the scientific yes. paradigm, completely materialistic dimension that we're mm. living out now. But So growing up for me, being a Londoner with Blake uh, was an incredible example of somebody who, who lived his own vision, who yes. uh, resisted the uh, material, you know, the flow towards complete materialism in yes. his time. And um, the other thing, when one tries to look, having studied Buddhism and, and the, the, the parallels with Tantrism, or tantric uh, uh, dohas and so on seem very clear. But what was da the daily life of Blake was, uh, he was a poet, he, he wrote his poetry down. Many sages don't write, actually mm -hmm. for, write themselves. Mm -hmm. Mila Repa's poems were um, written by uh, Rechungpa yes. and so on. And, but Blake was an active writer. You, Yes. Is the exhibition now, you can see what he was doing. Yes. And then he was an illustrator and a 
working with his visual apparatus the same way we do when we do dark retreats or these things. And then the other aspect, what was his practice? He was, he said, burning away apparent surfaces because he was a, yeah. an etcher and in great mm. I visualize this steam coming off the ground with, with Catherine there and there's this there's this sort of weird tantric <laughs> sort of you know sort of charnel ground scene almost of them making chemical uh, yes, thing. it was extraordinary anyway enough <laughs> or too much just speaking no, 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 not too much. but yes um, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention there. Because he worked extremely hard and really work was his absolute total way of life. I mean he had to just to keep alive, obviously, because he got paid so little. But also because he was completely devoted to it. It was his expression of his full nature, absolutely I'm sure. Um it's about Newton. It's rather unfair on Paul Newton. So for Newton was an alchemist himself. And uh, I think you know, Blake obviously used him as an archetypal figure of, of uh, reason separated from imagination and emotion. Mm -hmm. And he did this wonderful picture of Newton, of Newton naked on the shore with his eyes cast down to the sun, to the sun, not being able to see the stars, and just measuring the sun. And so, um, he did mean it as an allegory, I think, I hope. Um, Newton was a person. Maybe he just didn't bother. Newton was a person. And the interesting is that, that so many of these people who influenced him, like Swedenborg and um, uh, what was it, Count Sintendorf, I think his name was, who founded the Moravians, and so many of their influences were philosophers. At that time, philosophy and science were not really considered so separate. Mm -hmm. They were philosophers and they were scientists. And Swedenborg himself made many inventions. He was an engineer and a metallurgist and a botanist. And he made quite a few really significant discoveries, I think. But above all, he was a mystic. And towards the end of his life, he said, just devoted his whole life to meditation and mystical experiences. And he describes a lot of experiences which are very similar to ideas of what happens in, in dark retreats, for instance. And they used a lot. They used a lot of um, prana exercises, which I'm sure they must have been brought up doing. Mm. And this is really fairly new knowledge about him, I think. But he had a very close circle of friends, some of whom must have been interested in the same things, some who just adored him because of his work and just wanted to support him. It would be fascinating to know really more of what his practice was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.